The Prophet Muhammad repeatedly states that he follows the faith of saintly Abraham. And years ago, I, was, I found this really strange, because I'm like, well, why didn't he say, I follow the faith of saintly Jesus, or I follow the faith of saintly Noah, or the faith of saintly, I don't know, Joseph, for example. And I want to look at these passages within the Qur'an, because they deal, as we'll see, explicitly with exclusivism. And I'm going to make a proposal at the beginning, as to why I think this is. Now, this, this type of passage uh, often comes up where they'll say, well, the Jews say, this is in the Qur'an, the Jews say, you must be a Jew, the Christians say, you must be a Christian, say, no, I am of the faith of saintly Abraham, he was no idolater. And yes, this happens many times throughout the Qur'an, and I found it rather peculiar. <laughs> so, I'm going to argue this, that what you're seeing is, is the Qur'an referencing an argument by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. That argument the Apostle Paul is utilizing in the New Testament is itself rooted in a central three-man story within the Torah, within the Tanakh, within the Jewish Scriptures. And that this whole entire argument, this reference, the singular reference that we, is repeated over and over within the Qur'an, is to demonstrate that God's revelation, His covenant with humankind, manifests in diverse forms throughout history, albeit still being the revelation of God. That the concept of progressive revelation, so central to the Baha'i teachings, is being, if you will, showcased here within the Qur'an. And that in turn that this argument is going to actually be placed upon the shoulders of the Islamic community themselves in their relationship to the claim of Baha'u'llah. So this passage in the Qur'an, I propose, is trying to address the question of exclusivism. And in addressing the question of exclusivism, it's citing the New Testament and the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures, to show that God's revelation unto humankind has always come in diverse forms, and has always been unveiled for us through a successive series of messages from the sacred unto humankind. The general topic is one of exclusivism, the idea that there is only one path to the sacred, to reconciliation with God. Uh, for example, in Christianity, uh, the New Testament says there is no other name under heaven by which you may be saved, save that of Jesus Christ, or there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. Now, some of these particular features we will look at in future videos, including the exclusivism, for example, of Buddhism, or exclusivism of the Qur'an in general, in other texts, if you will. So the general idea is exclusivism, and it's the idea, say for example within Christianity, that those who are not followers of Jesus Christ are not saved. Now, years ago, when I would begin to have a dialogue with people, say from the Christian tradition, I would ask, well, you know, what about individuals like, say, who followed the Buddha? And by following the Buddha, I mean individuals that followed the Buddha in, say, 300 BC, 200 years after the Buddha came. Or those, say, who might follow the Bhagavad Gita in 300 BC, 300 years before the advent of Jesus Christ. And very often I encounter people saying, well, no, you can't be saved except through the person of Jesus Christ. And I would point out, well, that's peculiar because these individuals are actually following messages that come before the advent of Jesus Christ upon the plane of history. Certain individuals would say, well, no, it's still, you actually have to have accepted Jesus Christ. There is no way to be saved, if you will, unless you have recognized the person of Jesus of Nazareth. I would then ask, well, that's challenging because what about an individual who had, say, followed Moses? Someone who had followed Abraham? Someone who had you know, been with Joseph, if you will, in Egypt, and actually followed the, the messages of God unto humankind prior to the advent of Jesus Christ. Now, some people would stick to their guns and say, well, no, still, you know, you had to wait till Jesus Christ appeared, yet that seems to cause certain problems with the perspective of the Old Testament in how people were reconciled to God through the advent of Moses, through the revelation of Moses, and through the Jewish law. Now, what ended up happening is, is you encounter this argument actually within several epistles of the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul, that 
these individuals prior to Jesus Christ were accounted as righteous. Yes, they might be looking forward to the advent of Jesus Christ. Yes, they might be hoping for the coming of Jesus Christ and have in their beliefs and faith the coming of the Messiah, yet they were seen as righteous before God. Now, some of these texts we're going to examine. So this entire argument is to show that the vehicle of salvation changes. That while still it is the change of faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future, that in the New Testament, Paul uses a certain fact from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew Scriptures, that Abraham was righteous before the coming of the law, which allows for the viability, if you will, or the acceptability of Christianity, which is does not follow the law of Moses. And that the Quran uses Paul's logic, if you will, to bind Christians to their own scripture, in a sense, so that if you deny the argument of the Quran, you would then have to deny the argument of the Apostle Paul. Paul's argument itself is for the continued grace of God and the ability for people to achieve righteousness or reconciliation or salvation through the New Testament outside the Jewish law itself. And that this gate, once it's been opened by the Quran, uh, necessitates that it is possible that the Baha'u'llah's revelation could be a continued expression of that divine grace, of that vehicle of salvation that the Islamic community himself may be overlooking. There is another feature of this I want to call attention to, that if I'm correct on this point, this argument from the faith of saintly Abraham, um, it sheds light on why the Quran states that the followers of former revelations, for example, the followers of Christianity or the followers of Judaism, themselves were called Muslims. So this idea of why it is that within the Quran, if, if you, in case you're not aware, individuals who are followers of previous dispensations, like I said, Christianity and Judaism, uh, even the followers of Abraham, etc., were referenced as Muslims, which is peculiar. Now, within the Islamic community, certain individuals have taken this uh, in their mind to mean that the people who followed Jesus actually performed the five daily prayers. So they followed Quranic law. Um, they would have performed the Hajj. They would have done the specific Quranic or Islamic ablutions. They followed certain aspects that some people might refer to as the Sharia, the law of Islam itself. So um, this is not a universal belief, but this is a quite common one where people see the reference of the followers of Jesus as being Muslims to mean that they followed Islamic practices. Um, this sort of gets, if you will, dovetailed to this question because many um, Muslims will believe that the New Testament itself is corrupted. Uh, and this shows that it's corrupted because originally they followed the true faith, which was the faith of Islam. Uh, we deal with the question of the authenticity of the, of the New Testament according to the Quran in a different video on this site, if you'd like to look that up. There's another aspect <laughs> that comes up to this, is that if, in fact, the Quran is referencing an argument in the New Testament, which is itself based upon the Hebrew Scriptures, then this lends additional validity to the authenticity of the New Testament as a repository of the message of God unto humankind. So to be clear, if we can see that the Quran is utilizing an argument that the Apostle Paul uses within the epistles of, say, for example, um, Hebrews, Romans, and Galatians, then this is going to lend credence to the authenticity of the New Testament. Again, we've dealt with that actually more clearly in other videos, uh, but I do believe this sheds, if you will, greater light upon that question. The definition of Muslim, someone being a Muslim, has caused a lot of confusion, I think, within the Islamic community, for certain people, and much confusion between Islam and its uh, sister faiths. For example, Christianity and Judaism. And this theme will directly relate to exclusivism and this idea of the changeless faith of God, eternal in the past and eternal in the future. So we're going to start with a quote from the Quran, from Surah 3, chapter, uh, verses 67 to 68. Abraham was not a Jew, nor yet a Christian. But he was true in faith, a Muslim, 
and he joined not gods with God. Without doubt, among men, the nearest of kin to Abraham are those who follow him, as are also this messenger and those who believe. And God is the protector of those who have faith. So in this passage, uh, the Quran states something very clear, which is that Abraham was not a Jew, and I think in this context, meaning he was not a follower of Moses, not a follower of the Jewish faith, nor yet a Christian, but he was true in faith, a Muslim. And strive in his cause as ye ought to strive, with sincerity and under discipline. He has chosen you, and has imposed no difficulties on you in religion. It is the faith of your father Abraham. It is he who has named you Muslims, both before and in this revelation, that the messenger may be a witness for you, and ye be witnesses for mankind. So establish regular prayer, give regular charity, and hold fast to God. He is your protector, the best to protect and the best to help. So here we come to this uh, peculiarity and uh, source of confusion where it states that um, strive in his cause, he was posed no difficulties upon you. And it says, this is the faith of your father Abraham. It is he who named you Muslims both before and in this revelation. So individuals in previous times were also named Muslims and in this revelation as well. Okay, so the, the faith of uh, Abraham, those people were themselves Muslims. And this, as I've stated by some, has been taken to mean that that religion was the same as this religion. We now turn to the story of Joseph in the 12th chapter of the Quran, verse 38. And I follow the ways of my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And never could we attribute any partners whatever to God. That comes of the grace of God to us and to mankind. Yet most men are not grateful. O oh, my two companions of the prison, I ask you, are many lords differing among themselves better, or the one God, supreme and irresistible? If not him, ye worship nothing but names which ye have named, ye and your fathers, for which God hath sent down no authority. The command is for none but God. He hath commanded that ye worship none but him. That is the right religion, but most men understand not. It's Joseph speaking in verse 39 and 40. He states that he follows the ways of his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A refrain you see in the New Testament. And in verse 40 it says, He has commanded you to worship none but him. That is the right religion. So you're commanded to worship none but God. Um, but it's interesting, it says, most people understand, do not understand, sorry, what the right religion is. And I would suggest that this is an apt warning that we should take note of this. So he's saying, you are to worship one God and God alone, yet most do not understand this correctly. The same religion has he established for you as that which he enjoined on Noah, the which we have sent by inspiration to thee, and that which we enjoined on Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Namely, that ye should remain steadfast in religion, and make no divisions therein. To those who worship other things than God, hard is the way to which thou callest them. God chooses to himself those whom he pleases, and guides to himself those who turn to him. And they became divided only after knowledge reached them, through selfish envy as between themselves. Had it not been for a word that went forth before from thy Lord, tending to a term appointed, the matter would have been settled between them. But truly, those who have inherited the book after them are in suspicious, disquieting doubt concerning it. Here again is this peculiar feature of the Qurans, because it's saying that Muslims follow the same religion, quote, enjoined on Noah, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. And then it actually defines it. It says, namely, that ye should remain steadfast in religion and make no divisions therein. That those who make divisions worship other things than God. So we see that the followers of Noah, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, and Jesus, and of course, Muhammad, uh, were Muslims. Now, I think at least on the surface, 
it's clear that the founders of these religions, again on the surface, um, don't seem to be teaching the same thing. Nor do they seem to be offering the same practices to be followed. If you will, the duties of one's sacred expression within the Christian faith, say for example baptism, uh, doesn't seem to be present within the Quran. There are many laws within the Old Testament that don't seem to be present at all within Christianity. And we want to, uh, sorry, how would you put it? Many Muslims would claim that there is a corruption of the text, a corruption of the Old Testament and New Testament. Once again, we deal with that in a different uh, section of this, <laughs> this site. Um, the surface manifestations of God seem to alter, yet again, it appears here that the core remains the same. It says that you should remain steadfast in religion and make no divisions therein. Do not worship other things than God. And this is what Joseph said in the previous passage. So I would suggest that, and many within the Islamic community have also suggested this, the one who submits to the will of God is a Muslim. That to deny his message would be to not submit and to make one not a Muslim. That what we see is, is that the, again, we'll look into this more deeply in a moment, that the surface manifestations within the Baha'i writings, with the social teachings, if you will, of that religion do transform, they do alter, they do change, and yet the core itself, which is submission to the will of God and the recognition of his manifestations, is the same. We're going to look at this more deeply now. So the section I call the Old Wine, New Wineskins, and the Divine Assayer. At this point, we're going to turn momentarily to a parable that we find within the New Testament. This is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No. They pour new wine into new wineskins. So when it comes to an old garment, we do not sew a new patch on it, it's saving, it's interesting, um, because it will just tear away. Because of the, if you will, decrepit nature, or the tear deteriorated nature of the other garment. We don't take new wine and then pour it into old wineskins, because thereby we will actually ruin both. We, if you will, corrupt the wine itself, and it will burst, and we lose that new wine. Now, we're going to move to another couple passages of the New Testament to look at this to flesh it out. Jesus adds a further facet in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, verses 38 to 39. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say, the old is better. In this quote from the Gospel of Luke, it's stating that there is some new wine being brought, right? And it must be poured into a new wineskin. Because people become attached to the old wine, thinking it better because it is that which they know. And it's interesting, in the, the writings of Baha'u'llah, in the Most Holy Book, Baha'u'llah compares his revelation to new wine. Think not that we have revealed unto you a mere code of laws. Nay, rather, we have unsealed the choice wine with the fingers of might and power. To this beareth witness that which the pen of revelation hath revealed. Meditate upon this, O men of insight. Baha'u'llah is saying, we have brought not a mere code of laws, but we have brought new wine. And that new wine has been poured into the new wine skin, of Baha'u'llah's revelation. Yet we see within the New Testament 
that people will be attached to the old wine and the old wineskin. And he says, meditate upon this, O men of insight. And in some sense, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, if you will, meditate upon the question of new wine in new wineskins, and how that rates, relates sorry, to the changeless faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. Now, as I said, experientially, reading uh, the world scriptures, in this case, for example, the Old Testament, the New Testament, or the Tanakh, and the, and the New Testament, um, it seems very clear that when you move from the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, to the New Testament, to the Quran, that the surface manifestations of religion have changed. In the Baha'i teachings it says that the essential teachings remain the same, where the surface manifestations transform. Again, I want to address this question of yes, but they're corrupted. Once again, we have another video. Yet even if there was, even if one didn't accept that fundamental concept of the experience of these revelations, and that question, as you'll see in that other video, as to how God could expect mankind to be held to account if the revelation of God had actually been effaced, there is actually Quranic evidence for this. So we're going to change or turn, if you will, to a quote from the third surah of the Quran, and this starts on verse 50. I have come to you to attest the law which was before me, and to make lawful to you part of what was before forbidden to you. I have come to you with a sign from your Lord, so fear God and obey me. It is God who is my Lord and your Lord, then worship him. This is a way that is straight. This is Jesus Christ talking. And it says, he says, I have come to attest the law which was before me. Again, we addressed this in that other video. But then it says, and to make lawful to you part of what was before forbidden. Now, the, the root of these terms are halal and haram. So we're discussing the context of what is lawful within the law and what is forbidden. Here in the Quran, Jesus Christ states that he made what was haram, forbidden, halal, acceptable, and vice versa. The, record, the Quran is recording that Jesus, when he came, one, attested to the law before him, meaning he is confirming that what was given. He's not saying, oh no, I didn't say any of those things. He is saying, no, uh, that was the revelation sent unto you. And yet now I am actually taking what was in a previous dispensation, in a previous wineskin, the previous wine, I am now making what was forbidden to you lawful. Right? And in some cases, what was lawful forbidden. This comes out very clearly if you wish to look in the book of Acts, the story of Peter and Cornelius. The apostle Peter is actually experiences a vision that a Roman centurion wants to meet with them, and that this Roman centurion is a righteous person, and that he is to meet with them and teach him the revelation of Jesus Christ, teach him the good news, the gospel. And yet the Apostle Paul, following Jewish laws, believes he is not supposed to be eating with this individual, and supposed to be eating things that are unclean. And he has in this vision this picture uh, we won't go over this whole section, I believe it's in uh, chapter 8 of, of Acts, where all of a sudden this, if you will, this large tarp, if you will, comes down and there's all these animals which are unclean, uh, outside kosher food laws within the Jewish law, and he says, well, I, I, I can't eat these, and he's told actually by God to eat. And um, he says, but these things are unclean. And the response is, say not that it is unclean that which we have made clean. So you see, actually see this, uh, we'll be doing a series of videos on this as well, you see this process where the laws of Judaism are actually being transformed throughout the book of Acts, and then again, additionally by the Apostle Paul. So in this context of the Quran, the practices and laws of Judaism are altered, right? Through Jesus Christ, what was haram becomes halal, which was unlawful becomes lawful. And it says, interestingly, 
This is a way that is straight. Guide us to the straight path, which is the opening of the Quran. And it's interesting, you have what seems to be a winding path, in a sense, because it's altering its course, yet this straight, this is the straight path. And this is really, really important. Here we're having it saying that this is the way, this is the straight path, which is referenced in the very first opening surah the Fatiha of the Quran, that this straight path is that path where a central prophet of God in Islam, a manifestation in Baha'i terminology, is altering the course of the law. Okay? But there's other instances in the Quran of this. We deal with one of these in the question of the Qibla, the point of adoration of Islam. Uh, and again, I urge you to please take a look at that video. So here in the Quran, in chapter 2, verses uh, 142 to 144, the fools among the people will say, What hath turned them from the Qibla to which they were used? Say, To God belong both east and west. He guideth whom he will to a way that is straight. And we appointed the Qibla to which thou wast used, only to test those who followed the messenger from those who would turn on their heels from the faith. Indeed it was a change momentous, except to those guided by God. And never would God make your faith of no effect. For God is to all people most surely full of kindness, most merciful. We see the turning of thy face for guidance to the heavens. Now shall we turn thee to a Qibla that shall please thee. Turn then thy face in the direction of the sacred mosque. Wherever ye are, turn your faces in that direction. The people of the book know well that that is the truth from their Lord nor is God unmindful of what they do. There was a qibla, a point of prayer, where Muslims, for example, focus when they're praying, which was, in fact, Jerusalem. And it states, we have turned them from a qibla, which they were used to, right, unto another qibla. And this is actually very momentous, um, and it causes consternation in people within the story of the Quran, Except, quote, except for those guided by God. Right? And it's so, is the concept of a former Qibla, a former point of adoration, within even the Islamic community, recognized within the Quran? Yes. What was that point of adoration? It was the point of adoration of the people of the book. That then would have been what was halal, what was lawful, what was prescribed. Prescribed, sorry. Suddenly, in the middle of the prayer, as the story goes, the point of adoration changes to the sacred mosque, to Mecca. You have this new thing, which would have previously been haram, has now become halal. What was previously unlawful has now become lawful. And it says, the people of the book, it's interesting, know well that this is the truth from their Lord. Okay, well, that's kind of strange. That's rather odd, because how would the people of the book know that the changing of the point of adoration by the Prophet Muhammad was from their Lord? That doesn't seem to make sense, because if they knew it was from their Lord, they would be Muslim. I propose again that this is the same topic we're slowly going to unpack. It is what? That the people of the book, Christians and Jews, are aware of the changing of the law through the instrument of the Messenger of God or the Prophet. How is that so? Because it's happened before. It's not saying you know this is from God, in the sense that you know that Prophet Muhammad is from God. No, it's stating you know that this is the way of God. Any Jewish individual would be fully aware that the laws of Judaism in their time came from the prophet Moses, and that the vast majority of those laws were not what was followed by the followers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They followed different expressions of the divine. Yet when Moses came, a follower of Abraham, an Abrahamite, if you will, would look at this and say, well, what is this? This isn't what my fathers have actually followed, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
How is it that this is the expression of God? How is it that this is what is now halal? Okay, how is it that these things are now haram? Why are they actually being pushed to the side? You would have to see that if you were at all familiar with the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures. That you had this changing throughout Judaism. Once again, you see this within the New Testament. The Jewish law is not actually immediately, if you will, brushed, uh, not brushed aside, but if you will, abrogated by the New Testament. At first, it's actually adhered to. Again, a topic we will investigate more deeply. But then slowly, it actually begins to transform where Christians today do not follow really any of the, any of the Mosaic laws. So how I suggest that the people of the book know well that this is the truth from their Lord, nor is God unmindful of what they do. Okay, So God knows what they do do, and at the same time, God is aware, or so the people of the book are aware, that this is the path of God. A Muslim themselves has to recognize this, this is from the Quran, that the laws have changed, the Qibla was changed, Jesus changed what was halal to haram, what was haram to halal. Again, Mark 2, Gospel of Mark, New Testament, chapter 2, verses 23 to 27. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat and he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So this is a very famous scene within the New Testament, where Jesus is accused of breaking the law. And it's interesting, in this context, he states, well, first of all, I don't think this was... Um, a contravention of law itself, they're eating as they pass through. And any individual is, can eat on the Sabbath. Um, yet he then says, yet there are times where the companions were hungry and in need. He gives a reference from the Old Testament. right, And states that in the end you have to realize that there are, if you will, let me make this quick, some, there are contexts where things must be changed where certain rules or guidance have to be, if you will, augmented, and in the end, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He is, him, he is the messenger of God, who himself is the giver of laws. And this, this whole theme, if you will, from the teachings that those who follow Noah would follow, then Abraham, and then Joseph, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, on to Moses, on to Jesus Christ, is a theme that we see within one common faith, which is a work put forward by the world center. I mean, we're going to read a passage here very briefly. The succession of revelations of the divine also appears as an implicit, and usually explicit, feature of all the major faiths. One of its earliest and clearest expressions occurs in the Bhagavad Gita. I come and go and come. When righteousness declines, O oh Bharata, when wickedness is strong, I rise, from age to age, and take visible shape, and move a man with men, succoring the good, thrusting the evil back, and setting virtue on her seat again. This ongoing drama constitutes the basic structure of the Bible, whose sequence of books recounts the missions not only of Abraham and of Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, but of the line of lesser prophets who developed and consolidated the work that these primary authors of the process had set in motion. So in this first passage from uh, the collection or the work One Common Faith in the Bible World Center, it states, well, you take example of the Bhagavad Gita, and it's talking about progressive revelation, the successive unveiling of God's communication, his love letters to humankind. So in this context, uh, Krishna, who is the speaker here, states that 
from age to age, from time to time, I come again. When unrighteousness is on the rise and righteousness is on decline, I manifest myself unto men to, if you will, succor the faithful, right, and to push back evil. And then say it's very clearly the ongoing drama constitutes the very structure of the Bible. What does this mean? We've been talking about it the whole time. That you actually have a series of books. The Old Testament itself is a series of many, many books packed together and bound within the Jewish community. A recognition, an undeniable fact, that God's revelation unto humankind has taken place over time through successive manifestations, and that it has been augmented and consolidated at times. Right? That there are moments of expanse and moments of consolidation. That the New Testament itself, when, uh, especially when the Christian community took the New Testament and appended it to the Old Testament, it just completely, it, sorry, it, it just continued that expansion of a series of texts, where the revelation gets, if you will, augmented again and at times consolidated, where there are alterations in the face, if you will, of the revelation of God, yet its core essence is one and the same, a covenant between God and humankind. I mentioned the instance of Acts, but there are further instances within the New Testament where what you see as being, if you will, the expression of the divine in the message of Jesus Christ gets further augmented and altered by Peter and Paul, etc. This very structure of the Bible attests to progressive revelation. That change with faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. The quote continues. With the revelation of the Quran, the theme of the succession of the messengers of God becomes central. We believe in God, and the revelation given to us, and to Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and that given to Moses and Jesus, and that given to all prophets from their Lord. For a sympathetic and objective reader of such passages, what emerges is a recognition of the essential oneness of religion. So it is that the term Islam, literally submission to God, designates not merely the particular dispensation of providence inaugurated by Muhammad, but, as the words of the Quran make unmistakably clear, religion itself. While it is true to speak of the unity of all religions, understanding of the context is vital. At the deepest level, as Baha'u'llah emphasizes, there is but one religion. It states that Islam literally means submission to God, that there is one religion that we have experienced through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Noah, Jesus, and in this case, the Prophet Muhammad, that the religion of God is to submit to his decrees. That that is actually what every individual throughout would have to have experienced and it would have had to have done. That if I had been there with the Jewish people prior to the coming of Moses, and I was following, for example, the expressions of Judaism that I knew, and then all of a sudden Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with the new Mosaic law, I could easily say, well, this isn't the religion I grew up with. I like the old wine better. I prefer that better. And Moses himself could have said, well, you know, I, I have new wine here, and I'm not going to place it in an old wineskin. You actually have to take this wineskin, which is the receptacle, the vehicle of salvation, for this delectable wine from God unto you. Once again, when the Jewish per individual is suddenly sitting there in Palestine, in the first century of Palestine, and he experiences the revelation of Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, well, I like my old wine better. Right? I don't want this new thing. This isn't what I have followed in the past. Yet Jesus Christ is saying, well, I, am, I have new wine for you, and I've placed it in a new wineskin. This actually happened within the Jew Jewish revelation through the success of prophets. And in the New Testament, we actually then see augmentations of it by Peter and Paul. The Quran here is the same thing. This principle is beautifully testified to in one common faith right after the first passage we read. It is, therefore, an inadequate recognition of the unique station of Moses, Buddha, Zoroaster, Jesus, Muhammad, or of the succession of avatars who inspired the Hindu scriptures to depict their work as the founding of distinct religions. 
They are not honored by fumbling efforts to capture the essential mystery of their nature in dogmas invented by human imagination. What honors them is the soul's unconditioned surrender of its will to the transformative influence they mediate. It's beautiful. It says they're not honored by fumbling efforts to capture the essential mystery in certain dogmas, but the soul's unconditioned surrender of its will to the transformative influence they mediate. Islam, unconditioned surrender to a new wine in a new wineskin. We also find this definition of Islam and the process of, of revelation being open-ended within the Qur'an itself. This is from Surah 3, verses 81-87. to 87. Behold, God took the covenant of the prophets, saying, I give you a book and wisdom. Then comes to you an apostle, confirming what is with you. Do ye believe in him, and render him help? God said, Do ye agree, and take this my covenant as binding on you? They said, We agree. He said, Then bear witness, and I am with you among the witnesses. If any turn back after this, they are perverted transgressors. Do they seek for other than the religion of God, while all creatures in the heavens and on earth have, willing or unwilling, bowed to his will, accepted Islam? and to him shall they all be brought back. Say, We believe in God, and in what has been revealed to us, and what was revealed to Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and in the books given to Moses, Jesus, and the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between one and another among them, and to God do we bow our will in Islam. If anyone desires a religion other than Islam, submission to God, never will it be accepted of him. And in the hereafter, he will be in the ranks of those who have lost all spiritual good. I would love to do, and may in the future do, just an entire study of this passage. Why? Because it, it's so pivotal. This is the covenant of the prophets that is recorded in the Quran. The religion of God is submission to his will as we've seen within the Qur'an itself, and as we've seen in the quotes from Uncommon Faith. Here it says, a covenant is of the covenant of the prophets is being agreed upon between God and humankind, if you will, in a primordial state. What is that covenant? Okay, what is that solemn pact between God and humankind? I give you a book, and wisdom, and then comes a prophet. So, book, wisdom or understanding, and then a prophet confirming what, what is with you. Okay, so book, wisdom, apostle, confirming what is with you. Do believe in him and render him help. And it says that humanity says, we agree. God says, then bear witness, I am here amongst the witnesses. Then it actually states, one verse later, do you seek a religion other than this religion? When all have bowed to his will, accepted Islam. Now say, we believe in God, then it gives a series of messengers. We believe in God and in what has been revealed to us, what was revealed to Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and in the books given to Moses, Jesus, and the prophets. We make no distinction between one and another among them, and to God we bow in Islam." Okay, Now, what is that religion? What, what is the religion being expressed here? Because again, it's referencing Abraham, Noah, Isaac, Jacob, Jesus, Moses, and we've seen that the Qur'an itself and any study of these texts demonstrates that there is an alteration from dispensation to dispensation, even within dispensations. The very structure of the Bible testifies to this fact, that that religion of God is 
as stated in the text, submission to his will, Islam. Which is why in each of these cases, these characters are, are termed Muslims. Why the followers of Abraham were Muslims, why the followers of Noah were Muslims, of Moses were Muslims, of Jesus were Muslims, and the followers of the Prophet Muhammad are Muslims. Why? Because they have accepted and submitted to this religion of God, this one religion of God. And what is that covenant between God and man? That he gives you a book, and the wisdom, and then sends a prophet after. To me this is fascinating because it's an actually an open-ended loop, and it's really important, I hope I can make this as clear as I wish. The book comes first, the understanding and wisdom come second, and then another one will come. Another prophet, another Rasul, another messenger, another apostle will come, will confirm what came before, and then give new wine. Islam itself is de defined as an open-ended loop where if this is the religion of God, sorry, I'm pointing at text. <laughs> if this is the religion of God, which is that an apostle will come and will confirm and bring a new revelation, that is the religion. That is Islam, which is submission to his will. And it's very important because all throughout the history of religion, people have, and we're going to see this recorded in the Quran, people have said over and over and over again, okay, well, you know, I'm a follower of Joseph and that's it. We're done. I'm not following anyone else. And then Moses shows up. And no, no, I'm a follower of Moses and, and, and that, that's God's revelation. His hands are chained up. He cannot send another revelation. And then Jesus comes. Or, for example, multiple prophets in between. That here, if Quote, verse 85, and if anyone desires a religion other than Islam, submission to God, never will be accepted with him. Islam isn't the revelation and dispensation only expressed within the lifetime and the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. That is an impossible, untenable position. Islam is submission unto God's revelation. This eternal covenant of God and the confusions that we've had as to the true faith of God, the one essential religion, um, often comes to me in the parable of a father, their child, and a path. So it's like I came out, my father takes me out, and he says, Okay, son, you know, I want you to kneel down. So I kneel down, and we're sitting in, kneeling in front of this huge forest in front of us. And he kneels down beside me and he says, Okay, do you see this path in front of you? Do you see this path? Yes, Dad, I see that path. Okay, I need you to follow this path. This path is going to take you. I have to go somewhere. There's something I have to do. All you got to do is follow this path. And at the very end of the path, I'm going to be waiting for you. I'll be there waiting for you. But whatever you do, do not leave this path. Okay? And I'm like, okay, Dan, I, I got it. I'm not going to leave the path. I'm not going to leave the path. And he's like, it's right there. <laughs> it's straight ahead of you. Then he you know, pats me on the back, pats me on the head, and goes away. So I'm all, okay, you know, I'm going to follow this path. So I start to walk down the path, and I, you know, I get into the forest, and I'm coming. And then all of a sudden, the path turns right. All of a sudden, that path veers. Okay? And I'm standing there, and I'm like, okay, no, but he, he told me to follow this path. You know, and, 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 and I said I was, you know, I'm not going to be led astray, so all of a sudden I just run right into the bush. The path is the straight path of God. Yet we see within all of the world's religions that there is a, a wanderingness to this path, that it expresses the sacred in different ways. And I believe this is undeniable from any scripture that I know of, that this path meanders. That if we take it to mean we cannot follow if the path shifts, then we end up in the dark forest, in the wilds, away from our divine sacred parent. And we can see this. We can see this in the Torah, in the Tanakh, in the New Testament, and all of it confirmed within the Quran. And I believe it's fully the same if we look at Hindu and Buddhist and Zoroastrian scriptures, <clears throat> and that this is what we're being asked, right? 
It's even why, and I'll read a series of quotes um, from the Quran. Uh, the, the first being uh, verse, sorry, chapter 17, verse 77. This was our way with the messengers we sent before thee. Thou wilt find no change in our ways. So set thou thy face steadily and truly to the faith. Establish God's handiwork according to the pattern on which he has made mankind. No change let there be in the work wrought by God. That is the standard religion, but most among mankind understand not. Such was the practice approved of God among those who lived aforetime. No change wilt thou find in the practice approved of God. On account of their arrogance in the land and their plotting of evil, but the plotting of evil will hem in only the authors thereof. Now are they but looking for the way the ancients were dealt with? But no change wilt thou find in God's way of dealing. No turning off wilt thou find in God's way of dealing. Such has been the practice approved of God already in the past. No change wilt thou find in the practice approved of God. In these five passages of the Quran, we're told that you will not find a change. Which at first seems really peculiar because the Quran records changes. Things being forbidden made lawful, lawful made forbidding, the changing of the Qibla. It confirms the Torah in the New Testament. It confirms that revelations were given to other characters throughout time and that laws were different. Even, for example, the food laws, where the Quran actually confirms that it was actually placed upon the Hebrew people. But it's not in Islam. So what is this no change? It's the, that the path does meander. That we actually have to follow him and become Muslims. Submit to the revelation of God to humankind. Ye shall have no religion save Islam. When we look at this concept of the changeless faith of God, of this beautiful yet meandering path through the forest, that God has changed his religion over time, that new wine was placed into new wineskins, we can finally come to the central topic that I entitled this, the faith of saintly Abraham. The same religion has he established for you as that which he enjoined on Noah, the which we have sent by inspiration to thee, and that which we enjoined on Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, namely, that ye should remain steadfast in religion, and make no divisions therein. To those who worship other things than God, hard is the way to which thou callest them. God chooses to himself those whom he pleases, and guides to himself those who turn to him. So here in chapter 42 of the Quran, we have this idea that the religion actually given to the Prophet Muhammad is the same one that was given to Abraham, Noah, Moses, and Jesus. Namely, that you are steadfast in religion, make no divisions, and worship none other than God. So the Quran oddly proclaims that Muhammad is a follower of Abraham. And on, at least on the surface, this seems slightly arbitrary. Why not a follower of Moses, of Jesus, Adam, Joseph, etc.? And are they not equally Islam? If, in fact, the Quran states that all the followers of these different dispensations, these different revelations of God unto humankind are Muslims, why then does the Prophet Muhammad in the Quran proclaim that he is the faith of saintly Abraham. It says they're the same religion, so why Abraham's faith? So we're going to look at a couple quotes from the Quran to get more deeply into this. If any do deeds of righteousness, be they male or female, and have faith, they will enter heaven, and not the least injustice will be done to them. Who can be better in religion than one who submits his whole self to God, does good, and follows the way of Abraham the true in faith? For God did take Abraham for a friend. So here in this quote, it's stating that who could be better than the one who submits his whole self and follows the faith of Abraham? Again, why not the faith of Jesus? Why not the faith of the prophet Muhammad, given this is the revelation being God given to humankind? As we have seen above, the Quran says, again in chapter 22, And strive in his cause as ye ought to strive, with sincerity and under discipline. He has chosen you, and has imposed no difficulties on you in religion. It is the faith of your father Abraham. It is he who has named you Muslims, both before and in this revelation." So we see that 
This faith, which is the faith of Islam, is the faith of saintly Abraham, and he named you Muslims both before and in this revelation, the revelation of the Prophet Muhammad itself. God named them Muslims, which is the faith, the Millah of Abraham, not his religion, Deen. And there is a distinction that we find within the Quran that we're really looking at the creed or this proclamation of faith, the faith of saintly Abraham, as opposed to some particular religion. The Quran continues. Do they seek for other than the religion of God, while well, all creatures in the heavens and on earth have, willing or unwilling, bowed to his will, accepted Islam, and to him shall they all be brought back? Say, we believe in God, and in what has been revealed to us and what was revealed to Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and in the books given to Moses, Jesus, and the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between one and another among them, and to God do we bow our will in Islam." So the Qur'an's asking why people are seeking for some religion other than the religion of God. And that religion here is defined as that which was revealed to Abraham, Ismail, Jacob, and the tribes, and the books given to Moses, Jesus, and the prophets. And once again, we have this concept of the meta religion, where why is it that the Qur'an is not distinguishing, if you will, between the seemingly obvious differences between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? That is because you are supposed to be a Muslim, which means simply one who actually submits to the will of God when it is presented unto you. So there's this concept that the true religion of God is a transcendent religion that is revealed, if you will, in the separate pages of one book, or the separate volumes of a greater series of love letters from God unto humankind. The Quran continues stating that we should follow the religion of Abraham, here in chapter 3, verses 95 to 97. Say, God speaketh the truth. Follow the religion of Abraham, the sane in faith. He was not of the pagans. Verily, this is my way, leading straight. Follow it. Follow not other paths. They will scatter you about from his great path. Thus doth he command you, that ye may be righteous." So from the Qur'an's perspective, there is this one meta-religion that passes from Noah to Abraham to Jesus to Moses, etc. But we break that up into sects. Again, chapter 6 of the Qur'an. As for those who divide their religion and break up into sects, thou hast no part in them in the least. Their affair is with God. He will, in the end, tell them the truth of all that they did. So we must avoid this scattering. Chapter 6, verses 153, this breaking into sects, verse 159, and follow Abraham's faith, which is the straight path, a religion of the right, the path of Abraham who is true in faith, as in Quran, chapter 6, verse 161. Say, Verily, my Lord hath guided me to a way that is straight, a religion of right, the path trod by Abraham the true in faith, and he certainly joined not gods with God. So those who do not follow Abraham's path, which is this transcendent concept of the religion of God, end up breaking their religion into sects, into smaller groups, and in some sense, mankind commits shirk, this ascribing partners to God by making Christianity and Judaism or Islam equal to God, because the religion of God is that religion that is unveiled through progressive revelation. So now we're going to turn to the New Testament. And if we recall at the very beginning of this session, I was saying that I believe the reason why the Quran keeps referring to the faith of Abraham is due to an argument presented within the New Testament in the epistles of the Apostle Paul. And the Quran itself is hearkening to this argument, which the Christian should know, because it's in the New Testament, and it's based upon a principle, a story, and a teaching within the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, which give, if you will, the fuel for this fire. They, will, they give, if you will, the ground upon which this argument is in sown. So, 
The New Testament speaks of Abraham and what's called the law of faith, a faith that supersedes any dispensation of God's will, codified in a particular religious law, a faith that threads throughout history like a string, if you will, upon which are hung the beads and jewels or pearls of God's guidance. So we're going to start in the Epistle of the Romans. This is Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. The righteousness of God is being revealed from faith to faith, and Paul states that God's attributes are manifested so they are clearly seen, so that all mankind are, if you will, without excuse. Romans 1.20 For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Humanity, however, has turned away and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God, as we will see, for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, four-foot animals, and crawling creatures. This we will see in Romans 1.23. They turn, that is, to idols and to anthropomorphic representations of the Lord. The Quran proclaims that in abandoning Islam, the essential faith of God, the submission to his will, humankind turns to idols of their own imagination. In verse 25 of Romans 1, Paul continues, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So we've turned, if you will, from God to some creature, some creation of God, as opposed to worshipping God. And we're going to see this come out more as we continue, that I believe this is actually referencing the same theme. Romans 2, verses 25 to 29. For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who, though having the letter of the law and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God." The Apostle Paul here is using a law, actually which began in the time of Abraham, that of the circumcision. And he's saying that it's not the outward form, it's not actually the practice, the law of circumcision, that is the true circumcision, but rather it is actually the circumcision of the heart. It is the concept of sacrifice and marking oneself in the covenant of God. So the outward form, the outward expression, is not the point of the Jewish law. It is the inward workings of the Spirit, not the letter. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So it's not the works of the law, and this is one of the central themes, for example, of Romans, of Hebrews, and of the Epistle to the Galatians, that it's not this outward letter, it's not this outward form that actually sanctifies and makes one righteous. It's actually the inner spirit, the intention and the focus of the human psyche and its submission to it, and its sanctification and reconciliation with God. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption of which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The law of righteousness is the law of faith, and that in this context is belief in Jesus Christ. 
that the concept of one becoming reconciled with God is through belief in Lord Jesus, apart from the works of the law. Paul then finishes chapter 3 of the Epistle of the Romans saying, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? He is not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. So mankind is justified by faith apart from the works of the law because God is the God of the Gentiles also. So Paul is saying that there is a law of faith apart from any ritual law put forward by Moses and that the Gentiles are saved and seen as, if you will, carrying out the law by faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, there is redemption outside the dispensation of Moses and the law of the Torah. This is when the faith of saintly Abraham enters the picture. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. So the Apostle Paul here is pointing out that Abraham's faith was accounted as righteousness that it was through his faith in God, his belief in God, that he was actually reconciled, he was saved. That, just as King David stated, that through faith, lawless deeds have been forgiven. So being saved, he's pointing out, does not depend upon the law, because it is through faith that one does the law, that it is carried out in a spirit of reconciliation with God, and that the law of faith if you will, supersedes that of a particular dispensation. And he's citing Abraham here. To heighten this point, Paul continues and asks, Is this blessing, then, on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? So the question Paul is asking is, okay, so... Abraham, the central patriarch of the Jewish religion, was credited as righteous. He was saved. He was seen as reconciled with God. And the question that Paul is asking is, was this righteousness credited to him while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? While he was following particular works of the law or prior to that? Paul's conclusion, which is based on the Jewish scriptures themselves, follows. Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. For the promise to Abraham, or to his descendants, that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. When Abraham was accounted as righteous, he was uncircumcised, an expression of a particular law. That Abraham is the father of those who, quote, follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham through the righteousness of faith. So Abraham was saved by faith and accounted as righteous outside any particular law. And any who might follow in the faith, the steps of the faith of Abraham, are then saved. Recall that, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven, 
and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. For this reason, it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, A father of many nations have I made you, in the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. That by God's grace, those who are of the faith of Satan, the Abraham, will receive his promise. Paul then relates Abraham's faith in God regarding his coming children, for Sarah's womb was barren. This too was credited to him as righteous. In hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions, and was raised because of our justification. So Abraham grew in faith, giving glory to God, and this was credited to him as righteousness because he believed in God. That his credit, his credit of righteousness is extolled as the origin of the very grace and righteousness that Christians themselves re receive. So Jesus Christ is working, if you will, in the law of faith, which supersedes the Mosaic dispensation and the expression of the law. We have this again hearkening back, just like in the Quran, to the faith of saintly Abraham as the pillar upon which we have built the concept of Islam, the concept of submission to God outside of any particular revelation or dispensation. So now we're going to move to Abraham and Paul in the Epistle of Galatians. And this law of faith returns again, contrasted with the law of works. And this law of faith is so essential to God's religion, his essential religion, that Paul accuses anyone who does not abide by it as preaching a different gospel. Now often this concept has been taken out of context, and it's presented as if someone brings any other gospel, meaning like the New Testament, any other revelation, and tries to teach that to you that you should, must automatically reject it. The context of the letter, however, in the Epistle of the Galatians, is that one is the gospel of faith, the gospel of faith in Jesus Christ as faith in God, as opposed to the essential nature of following the Mosaic Law the teachings and rules and regulations of the dispensation of Moses. So that if anyone comes to you with a perspective of the teachings of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> stating that you must be a Jew, a practicing Jew, in order to be a Christian, that would be a different gospel. Uh, this was very, very prominent, if you will, in the early church, and actually this type of movement where you would have Christians who believed you had to follow Jewish law, can actually continued for centuries. So <clears throat> when he begins talking about this different gospel, and that we must follow the law of faith, not works, he's not talking about you shouldn't be following some other teachings from God. And I, um, I will urge you to look at our section on false prophets here on Bridging Beliefs. <clears throat> but rather, he's contrasting the following of the Mosaic law with the law of faith. In addition, this law of works itself does not mean ethical injunctions. The context of the epistle of Galatians and of Romans, and I would suggest of Hebrews, is actually speaking of the contrast between faith and belief in God and following the Mosaic law, a law of works. So we have to be very, very careful, and I do really, really do suggest that people read the epistle of Galatians, read the epistle of wrote to the Romans, <clears throat> and look at the book of Hebrews as well. Uh, so here we're starting in the first chapter of Galatians, and this is verses 6 to 9. 
So this different gospel that is actually represented is actually a distortion of the gospel of Christ. And this central teaching of the New Testament actually causes Paul to challenge the Apostle Peter, who herein is called Cephas, in the next section. So this is Galatians 2, verses 14-16. to But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, If you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? We are Jews by nature, and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. So here the faith in Jesus Christ is being contrasted with the works of the law, and Paul challenges Peter because he believes Cephas compels, Peter compels the Gentiles to live like Jews. He argues in contrast that mankind is justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, the Mosaic Law. And remember, when Paul says the works of the law, he means the ordinances the Jews followed in the law of Moses. It is in this next chapter that the saintly Abraham appears again in Paul's discourse. He first asked the people of Galatia, This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? So he's asking the people of Galatia, Did you receive the Spirit of God by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? So is the reason you're actually hearing of the Spirit of God, having the revelation of Jesus Christ and the good news of Jesus Christ given to you because of your obedience to the law? Paul continues his argument, once again founded on Abraham's faith. Even so Abraham believed in God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So here the Apostle Paul is saying, Look, Abraham believed in God, and his belief in God was accounted to him as righteousness, and that you are, by the faith in God, sons of Abraham. And it's interesting, it says actually that the scripture for seeing God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. So the gospel that Paul is talking about was preached to Abraham, right? All the nations will be blessed in you. So those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. So the gospel was preached beforehand, the good news. And it was through the faith of Abraham that he was accounted as righteous. And in taking part in that faith, we become children of Abraham. And remember, once again, the gospel was preached in the time of Abraham. So just as when we looked at the Quran, you can't really maintain, <clears throat> even according to the Quran, because of the changing of the laws that are explicitly testified in the context of the Qibla, the point of adoration, and as well because Jesus made what was haram halal and what was halal haram, that which was forbidden lawful or lawful forbidden. <clears throat> Likewise, it's impossible to maintain that Abraham, or any of his descendants, actually followed the historical doctrine and the social teachings of Christianity. It is a faith in God that binds these two historical dispensations of his will. How does Paul actually put this forward? He actually begins to make a chronological argument, and we'll review it in condensed form uh, for clarity and brevity's sake, but please read the epistle on your own time. What I am saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. 
but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. What is the Apostle Paul here talking about? He states that the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God. The Apostle Paul here is talking about the coming of the law of Moses centuries after Abraham was accounted as righteous. Paul continues with an explanation for why the law came, including it was added because of transgression, as we would see in verse 19, but that it was also a tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. This is in verse 24 of the same chapter. Now, it's important to actually, again, to read this in its, in its totality. But what the concept here is, is you have a time, and during that period of time, Abraham, in this example, is accounted as righteous. He is seen as reconciled with God. Then, 430 years later, you have the Law of Moses come up. But how can we have it that someone would need the Mosaic Law in order to be justified before God, in order to be accounted as righteous, when Abraham himself was accounted as righteous 430 years prior, and even he himself in the previous text was actually accounted as righteous before God, before even the Law of Circumcision, which was the context previously in Romans. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. So Jesus Christ, here in this section of Galatians, <clears throat> Jesus Christ's salvific act transforms all who believe into, in him into Abraham's descendants because they inherit that law of faith, that law of faith that superseded the law of works as given to the Jewish people through Moses. It is Abraham's law of faith that supersedes the law of commandments, commandments and ordinances of Moses. Thus the promise to Abraham is fulfilled by Jesus Christ, this law of faith. We now turn to Abraham and Paul, the epistle to the Hebrews. So the epistle to the Hebrews echoes and reinforces this same message, extolling the law of faith over the law of works. And we're going to start in Hebrews 11 verses 1 to 7. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death, and he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up he was pleasing to God. And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world, and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. The author of the Epistle of Galatians, the Apostle Paul, gives the examples of Cain, of Enoch, and Noah. In each case they are said to be accounted as righteous or pleasing unto God because of their faith and because of their obedience to the expressed will of God, their submission unto His will. This is the law of faith once again that started with the argument in Abraham and now other instances are being given, all of them being prior to the coming of the Mosaic Law. By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. 
for he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. All these died in faith, without receiving the promises, but having seen them, and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So here the Apostle Paul references Abraham, stating that he was commanded by God to leave his homeland, go to live in an alien land, and that he would not receive the promise that he was given, the assurance of things not seen. This was the definition of faith, that he was willing to submit his will unto God, Islam, because of his faith in God. The epistle continues with Abraham and then his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. By faith Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. So again, we're running through these characters, these great characters of the Hebrew Scriptures, who in each case are willing to, because of their belief in God, sacrifice their will and submit to the injunctions and commandments of God all prior to the coming of the Mosaic Law. The epistle then tells of Moses and his salvation from Egypt. By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. We've come from this Abrahamic archetype, as one who's actually willing to sacrifice their will and even the most precious things of their life because of their belief in God. In this section, the Apostle Paul goes to the life of Moses, looking at all the different times where actually the benefits of this world, the pharaonic court, if you will, security and comfort back in Egypt were actually cast aside because there was a greater promise, something greater and more beautiful out there on the horizon that actually he believed, Moses believed it could be achieved because he had faith in God. This is, if you will, in a very simple sense, the heart and spirit of anyone who actually takes up the mantle of trying to transform their society for the better, but knows they will not be able to see that which is the fruit of their works. This is the suffragettes. These are those who actually um, argued for universal suffrage. Individuals who went out and tried to change their world whether it be socially or politically, yet they themselves did this knowing that they would most likely never ever see the fruits. This is faith and belief in actually the calling of a greater cause, the calling of God to raise up humankind. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, 
of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us, so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. In each of these cases, the Apostle Paul is hearkening back to an entire role of honor, a roster of individuals who sacrifice their life in God's path. Literally, we're allowing themselves to be tortured, to be made exiled, to be imprisoned, who face the sword and the fire because of their faith in God. All of these scriptural figures that are being referenced, quote, gained approval through their faith. This law of faith guided and guides God's people in every age. This granting and grace of salvation, this righteousness, this covering of the sins is through faith, this transcendent law of faith, not through the works of the law. This is his way, his path, his will, the straight path. So faith in Jesus from the perspective of the Apostle Paul, I offer, cannot be rejected because of the law of Moses in the lives of the Hebrew people, because God's salvation has come through different vehicles, wine in different wineskins. I always come back to this. I think of, I, in my own thinking, I call them Josephites, those individuals who would have the last great figure, uh, for example, in the book of Genesis that we see is, is Joseph, Joseph of Egypt. And I think of someone who had actually been there with Joseph, or followers and descendants of the people who had been with Joseph. And all of a sudden, the revelation of Moses comes, and they're being given the law of Moses, right? And Moses is coming telling the people uh, the Josephites, the followers of the last, like you know, great image, the great figure of the of the of the Book of Genesis, these Josephites are hearing in Egypt of the coming of a messenger from their God. They are then given a series of sacramental, sacrificial laws and food laws that they themselves would not have had before. So any individual who had passed through, actually passed through this period of history, would have had to have grappled with, well, actually what's happening here is there is a revelation of God coming to me, claiming to be coming from the God of Israel, from the God of the Jewish people, yet it's coming in a wineskin, in a garment, in a vehicle that is not familiar to me. And I think this is often radically overlooked. And this is what's being called to mind by the Apostle Paul in the book of Hebrews, Galatians, and Romans, that there was this law of faith, that there was this, this sacred expression given to humankind in various forms throughout history. That there was a law of faith, however, and of course in the case of the Josephite, the followers of Joseph before the coming of Moses, they would have been asked, and were asked as recorded in Genesis, and in, for, ex for example in the rest of the Pentateuch, it's actually recorded that they're being asked to submit their will to a new expression of God's plan. Paul's central message, faith in Jesus, cannot be rejected because of the absence of the external letter of the law of Moses in the lives of the Christian community. Because God's salvation has come in other forms and other wineskins, and to do to deny that God can, let's say, for example, 
We don't grant that that means Jesus is actually a true messenger of God, but to deny that God's expression of his will, of his revelation, can be outside the law of Moses is an untenable position to hold. Because for large stretches of the history of the Hebrew people, they were not under the law of Moses, according to the very books attributed to Moses himself. I find it interesting because in my dialogue with my Christian brothers and sisters, there seems to be an identical response to this theme that is actually presented. So the Quran, to, to ground ourselves here, the Quran is actually saying, look, this is how I take this, these references to Abraham. The Quran is saying, look, there is a vehicle of salvation, which is this law of faith, which its archetype is the person of Abraham. And the actual reconciliation and salvation and to be accounted as righteous by God, it is to have that law of faith, not the law of a particular dispensation or revelation or messenger. Now, the Christian, and I understandably actually turns and says, okay, yeah, so maybe in, in previous times, right, in previous times there was uh, different ways and vehicles and vessels through which one could actually be accounted as righteous. I think it's impossible to argue that there isn't, given the nature of the letters of the Apostle Paul and the record actually of the Hebrew Scriptures themselves. But once Jesus came, that's it. Jesus is the only way, right? You have to be a Christian. And, it, and what I want to stress here is that that's the same argument that the Jewish people were actually saying to the Christians regarding the Law of Moses. Um, we actually see this. They see themselves as disciples of Moses, and that they are following the Jewish Law. And they could say, okay, that's fine. There was a time uh, before the coming of Moses where, sure, yes, there was the Law, the, the, you know, the faith of Abraham. I'm not going to say he's unrighteous. I'm not going to say that out about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Noah, etc. Um, but once the law of Moses has come, that now has stamped it and has sealed it, and we cannot move from there. So really, if you get it, the, the, the expression that I often hear from my Christian brothers and sisters is the same thing that they would reject from the actual Jewish community itself. And the Quran is trying to hearken this back, right? Because in the case of my example of the Josephite, they would have to say, well, no, I'm actually following the, uh, the, 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 the laws and teachings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of Joseph. Um, these are the teachings that I was given from my forefathers. What are, you, what are you trying to say? Why weren't these laws of Moses given previously? Right? And even the Jew themselves would have to say, well, we came to a time when actually the, this, these, this expression of the Law of Moses was ripe for the coming. It was, it was necessary to be given to the, the people of Israel. Prior to that time, it was, it was not relevant or was not yet. We were not mature enough for it to be applied. Uh, but that is actually what the Christian is saying to the Jew, and that's actually what the Muslim is saying to the Christian, and that is actually what the Baha'i is saying to the Muslim, the Christian, and the Jew. There is a particular challenge here that we'd have to address, because in the case of the Jewish law, it's, and I'm, it's important to know this, it sounds very much like when you're looking at uh, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures, that it seems as if, actually as if that revelation, that revelation of the Law of Moses, is a perpetual covenant. And it's something we're going to have to treat in a, in a separate video at a different time. For now, we're going to examine now the faith of St. Lee Abraham again, um, just to recall where we began. Who can be better in religion than one who submits his whole self to God, does good, and follows the way of Abraham, the true in faith? For God did take Abraham for a friend, saying, God speaketh the truth. Follow the religion of Abraham, the sane in faith. He was not of the pagans. He has chosen you and has imposed no difficulties on you in religion. It is the cult of your father Abraham, it is he who has named you Muslims, both before and in this revelation. Say, Verily my Lord hath guided me to a way that is straight, a religion of right, the path trod by Abraham, the true in faith, and he certainly joined not gods with God. Do they seek for other than the religion of God, 
while all creatures in the heavens and on earth have, willing or unwilling, bowed to his will, accepted Islam, and to him shall they all be brought back. Say, we believe in God, and in what has been revealed to us, and what was revealed to Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and in the books given to Moses, Jesus, and the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between one and another of them, and to God do we bow our will in Islam. So remember, the Quran clearly states the religion of God it was what was revealed to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the tribes, Moses, Jesus, etc. This parallels Paul's argument that there is a law of faith that runs, if you will, like a string through these pearls. Because they're clearly not the same. No one can actually claim that the faith that people were following in the time of Abraham was the same that it was actually in the time of Moses, or Jesus for that matter. The 16th surah, as we're about to see here, tells people to eat of the lawful things and the good things God provides. So eat of the sustenance which God has provided for you, lawful and good, and be grateful for the favors of God, if it is He whom ye serve. So shortly after, the Quran begins to speak of Jewish food laws, specific laws from the Torah. To the Jews we prohibited such things as we have mentioned to thee before. We did them no wrong, but they were used to doing wrong to themselves. But verily thy Lord, to those who do wrong in ignorance, but who thereafter repent and make amends, thy Lord, after all this, is oft forgiving, most merciful." It's interesting, I think this, this echoes Paul's epistle to the Galatians 3.19, where he states that the law was added because of transgressions. This was in verse 19. Why is the Quran here speaking of Jewish laws? Why does this suddenly start bringing up the laws that we find in the Torah? Uh, we're going to see because it continues immediately after to reference Abraham. Abraham was indeed a model, devoutly obedient to God and true in faith, and he joined not gods with God. He showed his gratitude for the favors of God who chose him and guided him to a straight way. And we gave him good in this world, and he will be in the hereafter in the ranks of the righteous. So we have taught thee the inspired message. Follow the ways of Abraham the true in faith, and he joined not gods with God. The Sabbath was only made strict for those who disagreed as to its observance. But God will judge between them on the day of judgment as to their differences. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching, and argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. For thy Lord knoweth best who have strayed from his path and who receive guidance." Here we have Abraham being presented as a model. Follow the ways of Abraham the true in faith. In verse 124, the Quran returns back to Jewish law. So it's talked about kosher food laws, and now it starts talking about the Sabbath, which was only made strict for those who disagreed as if an injunction was set down to settle a matter. So it moves from these kosher food laws to a statement about Abraham being true in faith, and states that he is in the ranks of the righteous in the hereafter. So Abraham is actually being juxtaposed to those under the law of Moses. And it says he's in the ranks, as if there's a list. So we have like this this list of individuals that we could see as being accounted as righteous, as being accounted as sanctified before God, in the hereafter, being juxtaposed with the law of Moses. Now, this is very peculiar because that's actually what we just read, and what we've actually seen in the book of Hebrews, the book of Romans, and the book of Galatians. We have this role of honor, the ranks of the righteous, actually being put forward. The Quran itself is saying, okay, so there's these, these laws, there's these kosher food laws, there's the law of the Sabbath. Yet on the other hand, there's this character, and there's this character, and, and, and everyone knows him, you know, within like the Judeo-Christian and Islamic traditions. Everybody knows this character. This character is Abraham. He's a major patriarch of the faith, and he is accounted as righteous apart from these laws. Yet at the same time, he is in ranks of righteous. And I think this very clearly echoes the epistles of Paul. 
Now, in spite of the parallels, <laughs> could this be a cr could this actually be coincidence? Is it possible that this is not a rebuttal to the exclusivist tendencies in Judaism and Christianity? The Quran does, however, use the same argument as Paul's in Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, but now applies the same logic to Christians as well. The section of Surah 2 proclaims this. They say, Become Jews or Christians if ye would be guided to salvation. Say thou, Nay, the faith of Abraham the righteous, and he joined not gods with God. So in this case, the topic is clearly exclusivism. They are being told that if you are to be guided, right, if you are going to be righteous before God, become Jews or Christians. The response here is, no, the faith of Abraham the righteous, he joined not gods with God. So this is clearly a topic of exclusivism. Why does the Quran add this final statement though, he joined not gods with God? The Holy Quran actually explains. Say ye, we believe in God, and the revelation given to us, and to Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes, and that given to Moses and Jesus, and that given to all prophets from their Lord. We make no difference between one and another of them, and we bow to God in Islam. So the Quran states, right after talking about an issue of exclusivism, saying, no, we believe in the God of Abraham and Jacob and Moses and Jesus. This religion, if you will, that undergirds or transcends them all. And true Muslims do not make distinctions between them, but bow to God. To avoid any further confusion, the Quran continues in verse 137. So if they believe as ye believe, they are indeed on the right path. But if they turn back, it is they who are in schism. But God will suffice thee as against them, and he is the all-hearing, the all-knowing. So to believe in all of these prophets, an individual has to believe that, if you will, the countenance of God, the expression of God's will into humankind, has actually shifted. To accept their scriptures, right, to accept that which was given unto Moses and Jesus, right, and the prophets, is to avoid schism. And I propose is to avoid joining gods with God. That in some sense, in each of these cases, there's a reference in the Quran where it says they say that God's hands have been chained up, chained up be their own hands. They're taking the revelation of God and claiming it supersedes God. Now, both in the New Testament, as recorded in the Torah or the Tanakh, and referenced in the Quran, the point is no, there's actually a way to see this. We can actually see this through this role or the ranks of the righteous. So we have to be able to see this as being that which prevents schism in and of itself. Say, will ye dispute with us about God, seeing that he is our Lord and your Lord, that we are responsible for our doings and ye for yours, and that we are sincere in our faith in him? Or do ye say that Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes were Jews or Christians? Say, do ye know better than God? Ah, who is more unjust than those who conceal the testimony they have from God? But God is not unmindful of what ye do. So once again, this is clearly, clearly about, if you call dispensationalism and exclusivism of specific dispensations from the Quran's perspective. The question is, if Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes were Jews or Christians, the answer, obviously, is no, they were not. Likewise, in the case of the Quran, which we looked at the beginning of this deepening, um, the followers of Abraham, Jesus, and Moses were Muslims, in the sense they were submitters, but they were not followers of Islamic laws and the Islamic revelation. That is a particular, if you will, dispensation or revelation from God unto humankind. So it's interesting, the same question gets echoed back upon the Muslim community, back upon those who love the Quran itself. These figures all predated, in this case, when the Quran is asking, these figures all predated Moses and Jesus, 
and they were according to the Quran and the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament accounted as righteous before God. What's interesting here is this, this, this quote ends, and this is in verse 140, God states, Who is more unjust than those who conceal the testimony they have from God? And this is very peculiar. The Quran, the Quran claims that the Jews and Christians know this, and that they're concealing a testimony they have. Why? Because the concepts actually reside within both Christian and Jewish scriptures. So there's an intentional act of concealing, of hiding something, of a testimony they actually have from God. And God is not unmindful of what you do. So the Quran is saying these communities have something in their own possession that they're aware of, and they're concealing it, and God is aware that this is being done. This is because I offer everything we've actually looked at that this itself is a central story, a central sacred story within the Jewish scriptures. This central sacred story is leveraged very heavily within the New Testament, in the epistles that follow the four Gospels and the book of Acts, those written by the Apostle Paul, as we have looked at, Romans, Hebrews, and Galatians. It is a central argument of the Apostle Paul, and at the coming of the Prophet Muhammad has actually been cyclically used and addressed and discussed for six centuries. It is held within the scriptures of both these communities. So it's saying, God is aware that you are aware of this fundamental concept. Remember, we just walked through this surah. It's actually talking about the Mosaic Law. It's actually referencing that Abraham was recognized as righteous apart from it, and that he was actually in the ranks of the righteous, echoing Galatians and Hebrews. That, these, that this law, this transcendent law, itself overarches all of the different dispensations and expressions of the prophets of Israel, of Jesus, of Moses, of Jacob, of Isaac, of Abraham, etc. I believe the Quran is uh, profoundly clear on this front, that they are to look to their own scriptures and see within these stories and these arguments by the Apostle Paul that this maintaining the exclusivism as they see it is an untenable position. This is actually where, in this passage, shortly after, this is where it discusses the changing of the Qibla, the changing of the point of adoration from Jerusalem to Mecca. So once again, we've got kosher food laws, right? We've got the Sabbath, and it's interesting that the kosher food laws and the Sabbath and the change in the Qibla are actually used. Now we referenced this right at the very beginning, um, that the food laws were something that appears in a central moment in the book of Acts. And again, forgive me, I believe it's Acts 8, the book of Acts of the New Testament, where actually it is a vision the Apostle Peter has of this tarp, of this huge like garment coming down with unclean animals, unclean because of kosher food laws, and that he's told to slay them and eat them, these unclean animals. And that this is referenced then just after to his the necessity of him accepting and welcoming the Gentile centurion Cornelius into the Christian fold. We know this because Peter himself says, I, I'm not supposed to be eating with you. Right? So we have these kosher food laws. Um, the Apostle Paul actually, within his epistles, talks about the concept of uncleanness and that things are not in themselves unclean. This is that transference from the Jewish, or so the Christian community that adhered to the Jewish laws, and the, if you will, the, the, the fading away of those laws. We then had a reference to the Sabbath, and it's interesting that that Sabbath is the topic that came up in the context of Jesus Christ, where he stated he was Lord of the Sabbath. Then we actually have this other instance used, which comes right after the passage we just read, which talks about the changing of the Qibla from Jerusalem to Mecca. 
So in each case we're talking about a shifting, an altering, new wine, new wineskins, etc. Say, O people of the book, come to common terms as between us and you, that we worship none but God, that we associate no partners with him, that we erect not from among ourselves lords and patrons other than God. If then they turn back, say ye, bear witness that we at least are Muslims bowing to God's will. So we're not to associate partners with God or erect lords and patrons other than God. The Quran continues. Ye people of the book, why dispute ye about Abraham when the law and the gospel were not revealed till after him? Have ye no understanding? Ah, ye are those who fell to disputing even in matters of which ye had some knowledge. But why dispute ye in matters of which ye have no knowledge? It is God who knows, and ye who know not. Abraham was not a Jew, nor yet a Christian, but he was true in faith, and bowed his will to God's, which is Islam, and he joined not God's with God. Without doubt, among men, the nearest of kin to Abraham are those who follow him, as are also this messenger and those who believe. And God is the protector of those who have faith. Ye people of the book, why dispute ye about Abraham when the law and the gospel were not revealed till after him? Have ye no understanding? Ah, ye are those who fell to disputing even in matters of which ye had some knowledge, but why dispute ye in matters of which ye have no knowledge? It is God who knows, and ye who know not. Abraham was not Jew, nor yet a Christian, but he was true in faith, and bowed his will to God's, which is Islam. And he joined not God's with God. Without doubt, among men the nearest of kin to Abraham are those who follow him, as are also this messenger and those who believe. And God is the protect protector of those who have faith. Once again, central exclusivistic issue. Why do you dispute about Abraham when the law and the gospel were not revealed after him? This is a message to both of them. This is the dispute. So they're talking about Abraham, and the, both these communities, communities have to realize that the law of Moses, the Torah, and the actual gospel were not revealed to after, until after him, right? But once again, he was true in faith, bowed his will to God. This directly echoes the argument from Galatians. What I am saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Christians would be aware of Paul's argument. Any educated Christian Anyone who really listened to the sermons and the readings within the Christian churches would be aware of this. And living in a Christian era, and having had these arguments, the Paul's arguments presented to them, the Jewish community themselves would be aware of this ongoing, if you will, meta-argument. This is why the Quran states immediately after, It is the wish of a section of the people of the book to lead you astray. But they shall lead astray not you, but themselves and they do not perceive. Ye people of the book, why reject ye the signs of God, of which ye are yourselves witnesses? Ye people of the book, why do ye clothe truth with falsehood, and conceal the truth, while ye have knowledge? So again, there's this express statement of the clothing the truth with falsehood, but also rejecting the signs of God of which ye yourselves are witnesses. Now, the, if you think about this, obviously it can't be them being witness to the signs of the Quran, because they are Jews or Christians, if they actually recognize the signs of God in the Quran, and the truth inside the Quran, right? They would then be Muslims. Yet here, the people of the book, Jews and Christians, clothe truth with falsehood and conceal while they know. The truth is being clothed with falsehood because there is a denial of one's own scriptures if we adhere to this simplified form of exclusivism where you have to be a Jew or you have to be a Christian. Jews are witnesses because the Hebrew scriptures testify to this fact, 
And again, Christians are obviously witnesses because the New Testament proclaims this very argument to the Jewish community, well, in this case, to the Hebrews, the Romans, and Galatians. And herein lies a lesson for the Muslim. Muslim, for the Quran states this, And believe no one unless he follows your religion. Say, True guidance is the guidance of God. Fear ye, lest a revelation be sent to someone else, like unto that which was sent unto you, or that those receiving such revelation should engage you in argument before your Lord. Say, All bounties are in the hand of God. He granteth them to whom he pleaseth. And God careth for all, and he knoweth all things. For his mercy he specially chooseth whom he pleaseth. For God is the Lord of bounties unbounded. I find this a fascinating quote because it's this idea of believing no one unless he follows your religion. But true guidance is the guidance of God. And to be wary lest a revelation be sent to someone else, like unto that which was sent unto you, or that those should engage you in argument before your Lord. So be, be wary to the Muslims, to the Jews, and the Christians, that a revelation might, like it was sent to you and other communities rejected, right? That a revelation might be sent to someone else, and then all of a sudden you're arguing with them, like the Josephite might have argued with the Jew, like the Jew would argue with the Christian, with the Christian with the Muslim, the Muslim with the Baha'i. That it's very, very important that you be wary because you might now be arguing against God. Right? And in this case, you might be arguing against an argument upon which your own faith, your own religion, is founded, like the argument of the Apostle Paul or the belief in the righteousness of Abraham. So the Baha'i faith identically lays the Quranic argument before the Muslim and says, You too are witnesses. You know the signs of God. Do not conceal this truth. Even if Baha'u'llah, for example, isn't true, is it possible that a revelation has been given unto a people other than you, like it was given unto you, and you are now arguing, potentially against your own holy book? Okay. So Abraham was neither Jew nor Christian nor Muslim. He was true in faith and didn't join gods with God. Or do ye say that Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes were Jews or Christians? Say, do ye know better than God? Ah, who is more unjust than those who conceal the testimony they have from God? But God is not unmindful of what ye do. So do Muslims say that Abraham, Ismail, Isaac, Jacob, and the tribes were Jews or Christians, and part of the term, or Mohammedans? No, they were Muslims, those who submitted to the will of God. So to be a Muslim is to submit to the will of God in whatever vessel it comes in. That this whole section has actually shown that the religion of God, the religion of faith, belief, and then submission to the will of God, like that of Abraham, like that of Noah, like that of the prophets of God, that those that got tortured, that got exiled, that got imprisoned, is to hear the call of God, to stand up, and actually follow through. That to be a true Christian is, to quote uh, Revelations 14.4, to follow the Lamb wherever He goes, regardless of it's where you feel He would have gone. Just like the Jews in the first century of the Christian era had to accept that the Law of Moses was no longer in play, in the letter of the Law, but rather in the spirit of the Law. That the, if you will, the wine skin had actually changed. That we have to be able to see that God's expression, God's revelation to humankind actually can come as a light in various different lamps, as wine in various different wineskins, that not to love the lamp, but rather to love the light that it brings. That if we are to taste, if you will, of the wine in that wineskin, and then we taste another, though the wineskin may look different, that we should be able to recognize the same sweetness, the same intoxicating effect of that message. How much more so if the wine that you are now drinking in a new wine skin is actually sweeter than that which was before. And the Quran here is hearkening through this reference to the faith of, faith of saintly Abraham, is referencing to this transcendent, eternal religion of God, 
from the past to the present through the dispensations of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the tribes, the prophets, all the way through Jesus, the prophet Muhammad, and in my perspective, obviously, in the case of Baha'u'llah, who in the Kitab i says he has brought a new wine unto humankind, and it is in a new wineskin. The lover seeks the beloved wherever he may be found. That we are to recognize the shepherd's voice because we know it even though it may come from a different direction. If the sun rises from a different place upon the horizon, we must still recognize it as that same sun. That the Quran here through the faith of saintly Abraham and his righteousness is calling down through this primordial scriptural history to the pages of the Torah, the Gospel, and the Quran, and calling all of these communities to recognize that the same light has appeared in a new lamp, that there is a new wine in a new wineskin. The path to God is the straight path, like that path through the forest that my father bent down and told me to actually follow. It can meander, and in fact, if we can't, if we if we look at the revelations of God from any of these perspectives, it actually has meandered, although this is the path to meet our beloved parent at the end of that possibly dark forest. His path is the eternal religion of God, where his will is manifest, and we must submit. This entire story hearkens to the epistles of Paul and lends credence to the bounty and beauty of the epistles of Paul in the New Testament because the Quran itself is echoing an argument put forward by the Apostle Paul in that ranks of the righteousness, the eternal law of faith. And this is laid at the feet of the Christian, of the Jew, and of the Muslim, that maybe even Baha'u'llah himself is not a messenger of God, yet this is the religion of Islam, and you shall have no religion save Islam. Submission to the commandments of God even if they be in a different lamp or a different wineskin. Thank you very much.